What is up guys, it is the Sound Alchemist, and today I'm back to bring you 40 facts on the Warhammer 40k universe. This time, we are doing chaos yet again. We will be going into the warp to learn about the chaotic domains of the four gods. So let us begin our lore with the god of blood, skulls, anger, hatred, and war. That's right guys, this is the Fortress of Corn. The Fortress of Corn is a dominion, a monument to fury and violence. It is built upon foundations of murder and conflict, and it is home to every faucet of battle. This blood-soaked realm echoes constantly with Corn's bellows and the clash of weapons, the cracking of whips, and the clarion calls of innumerable brass warhorns. At its center, Corn's cavernous chamber is lit by a great fire pit, where dark flames consume the souls of cowards who were cut down as they fled from battle. This Hayesfield throne room sits in the central of the brass citadel, the Castle of Corn. Decorated with red-veined marble, the metal walls of the unholy fortress are broken in by jagged outcrops, encrusted with blood and armored with serrated spurs of blood-stained brass. Outside, hideous gargoyles leer from every parapet, ready to spew scalding streams of fiery metal upon those foolish enough to besiege the fortress. The formidable moat of the brass citadel is filled not with water, but with boiling blood of those who have lost their lives to war. Beyond the moat lies leagues upon leagues of crackened land, littered with the splintered bones of those fallen in battle. Packs of slavering flesh hounds prowl these wastes for intruders, skirting along the edges of the seas of blood, roving through mazes of bone and tracking down any interlopers. This blasted wasteland is split by a great crevasse, a canyon many miles long and unfathomably deep. It is said that in one of Korn's particularly vehement rages, he took up his immense sword and smote the ground, splitting it asunder for eternity. Occasionally, the Canyon of Death erupts with a tide of hot blood. The flood of gore spills out over the plains and sweeps away the heaps of headless corpses and mountains of skeletal remains, surging forth as if the universe itself is bleeding from some hideous wound. A chain of immense volcanoes constantly smoldering girdles the Blood God's domain. Corn's roars of rage cause the ground to shudder, and each day the volcanoes spew out rivers of earth blood as hot as his anger. Next up is the realm of the Changer of Waves, Zeech's Domain. The Crystal Labyrinth. Of all the outlandish landscapes of the warp, Zeech's Domain is the most bizarre and incomprehensible. His realm is woven from the raw fabric of magic. The Crystal Labyrinth as it is known, sits upon an immense iridescent plateau, its presence felt across all of the demonic realms. Shifting avenues made from crystals of every color crisscross Zeech's realm as it contorts through the nine dimensions all at once. Hidden pathways built from lies and schemes infiltrate the domains of other gods, binding together the fraction realm of chaos, the better to direct them all to Zeech's will. This labyrinth does not merely reflect, but also distorts, pulling apart aspiration and purpose, and turning it into insanity and despair. In its attempts to mirror Zeech's convoluted scheming, the crystal labyrinth constantly moves and rearranges. Those brave souls lost within the maze's reaches will wander for eternity, their minds shattered and their dreams broken upon the wheel of their own failed ambition. The faces that are reflected from the crystalline walls at such intruders are rarely their own. Everywhere, doublegangers of those caught in the thrall of Zeech's flicker and spark across the prismatic walls. In the inner reaches of the maze, a web of crystal corridors burst into jagged shards as Ariman, the great chaos space marine sorcerer of the Thousand Suns, leads the warriors of his legion to war, only to be trapped once more by their own reflections. A planar sheen buckles under the gaze of the Eldar Farseers of Othway before throwing back the image of a burning craft world. A radical sect of Inquisitors binds a mirror demon to their will with a forbidden version of the Emperor's Territ, little knowing that in doing so, 
They have bound their souls to its counterpart. These and a million other glimpses of reality flicker like flames in the wind, their energy making the labyrinth glow with possibility. The hidden library is infinite in dimension and constantly folds in upon itself under the weight of its own density. It contains every scrap of knowledge, every thought of every creature across space and time. The books, parchments and scrolls that line its ever-folding walls are bound with chains of magical fire, row upon row, shelf upon shelf, stretching into the imponderable recesses of Zeech's lair. Countless pink horrors and blue horrors creep and crawl here, tending to the vast collections of the hidden library. The grimoires chatter to their keepers, trapping the horrors and webs of deceit and scandal, so that the demons eventually fade into the substance of the predatory library itself. Next up is the father of plagues, Nurgle, in his disgusting, putrid garden. The domain of Nurgle is not a barren wasteland, but a paradise, a near-infinite jungle of death and pestilence. Tended by the Lord of Decay, this unwholesome realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable. Twisted, rotten boughs, entangled with grasping vines, cover the moldering ground, entwining like broken fingers. Fungi, both plain and spectacular, break through the squelching mulch of the forest floor, puffing out clouds of choking spores. The stems of half-demonic plants wave to their own accord, unstirred by the insect-choked air. The colors of puncture, the gloom, havens of cheeriness in a dismal woodland. Human-featured beetles flit along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. Reeds rattle, whispering the names of poxes inflicted upon the worlds of mortals by great Nurgle, or lamenting those that have died from the caress of their creator. Jutting from amidst the primordial mire is Nurgle's manse. Decrepit and ancient, yet eternally strong at its foundations, the mansion is an eclectic structure of rotted timbers and broken walls, overgrown with crawling poison ivy and thick mosses. Cracked windows and crumbling stone complete with coated bronze, rusted ironwork, and lichen-covered chronicles to outdo each other with their own corrupted charm. Within these tumbling walls, Nurgle toils. Beneath the mildew and sagging beams, the great god works for eternity at a rusted cauldron, a receptacle vast enough to contain all the oceans of the worlds. Chuckling and murmuring to himself, Nurgle labors to create contagion and pestilence, the most sublime and unfettered forms of life. When Nurgle's diseases wax strong in the mortal realm, his garden blooms with death heads and fresh filth, encroaching upon the lands of other chaotic gods. War follows as Nurgle's adversaries fight back, and the plaguebearers take up arms to defend the morbid forest. From such war springs more of the richness of life and death, of triumph over adversary. Though Nurgle's realm will eventually recede again, it will have fed deeply on the fallen, and will lie in gestate peace until it is ready to swell throughout time and space, once more for all eternity. And finally we come to the bane of the Dark Eldar and the Eldar, the Dark Prince himself, or should I say herself. Slanesh. The Palace of Slanesh. Few gods welcome intruders to their empire, but there is one who loves to tempt visitors to an unnatural domain. This is Slanesh, the Dark Prince and Lord of Pleasure. Those that dare enter his territory risk becoming trapped in its warped delights for all of eternity. The Dark Prince's realm is divided into six domains, arranged in concentric rings about the Palace of Pleasure. While they might be mistaken for paradises, nothing is what it seems here. Each region is not only a celebration of Slanesh's desires, but also his chief defense. An intruder can only reach the Palace of Pleasure in the very heart of Slanesh's territory by passing through all six of the circles, an act of will beyond most souls, both mortal and demonic. One amongst the mortal visitors to his realm still looms large in the memory of Slanesh. However, a wandering knight of the Adeptus Astartes, whose will was as strong as a silvered adamantium. Now who might this be? 
The first circle the knight pushed through was richly appointed beyond the dreams of kings. Mountains of stacked gold reached toward the rainbow mosaics of gemstones in the marble vaults high above. Glittering ingots and diamonds beyond counting littered the ground. The knight marched past many a starveling wretch attempting to count the innumerable gold coins. The knight had left notions of material wealth long behind, and he strode on without touching so much as a single coin. Crunching his way across a beach of golden teeth, the knight came to the shores of a vast lake of dark wine. The lake was dotted with pallid islands formed from the backs of giants, each linked by criss-crossing bridges. The backwater hands of each giant held atop a table that groaned under the weight of a lavish feast. There he saw mortal men gorging themselves on the banquet, wide-eyed and desperate in their hunger as others frantically tried to gulp down the lake itself. The bloated and obese moaned in pain as they crammed ever more food into their wine-stained mouth, but the knight pressed on. He distaste twisting in his features as he passed the grisly remains of those who had consumed so much that they physically burst apart. The wanderer made his way through fields of golden light and soft hay, where lissom maidens and beautiful youths frolicked near naked in the hallucinogenic musk of the lithe beast that converted with them. The faces and fertile forms of the dancers were impossibly sensual, molded to the perfect desire of the heart. The knight held his breath and closed his eyes, for though mortal pleasures were forbidden to his ordal, part of him was still a man. The crooned nymphs gathered around a knight, stroking his silvered armor and whispering of the sweet carnal pleasures they would give him. But he yielded not. The severed limbs and heads that lay underfoot spoke of the truth behind the honeyed eyes. Eyes shut, he cut down the demonette seductresses around him, one after another, letting revulsion guide his shining blade. After fighting his way through the feminine contours of the foothills ahead, the knight emerged onto a balcony where he was greeted by roars of adulation and approval. An army of space marines so vast its number was beyond counting awaited before him on an endless plain, listening in fevered anticipation of his commands for conquest. Planetary governors nodded in obsequious anticipation, and the high lords of Terra smiled at him from smaller balconies of their own motioning him to speak. The knight recognized one of the rulers from his own mortal life, and he stood before him, looking deep into the philosopher king's eyes. Beyond the mask of power and self-assurance, he saw eternal nagging paranoia, gnawing suspicion and hidden doubts that were acid to the soul. The king shook his head sadly and walked away. Wearied by his ordeals, the wanderer strode on through a mesmerizing woodland paradise its maze of pathways thick with flowers and heavy with thorns. The gentle, fragrant breeze whispered to the knight of past glories, reminding him of the executions he had performed in the emperor's name. Mirrored pools reflected the knight as a shining saint, his face serene but his sword bloodied as he artfully carved apart rank after rank of red-skinned demons. The warrior turned away troubled. In the distance he could make out tortured figures staring intently into mirror pools of their own, each held immobile by the undergrowth as whispering thorns insinuated themselves into their flesh. The wanderer turned his mind to the humility of the cell he once called home. As he did so, the path through the maze withered and straightened out before him, so the night continued on. A never-ending beach stretched away from the night, Heavenly choirs sung soothing lullabies as he perfumed sea lapped at the fortress walls of his mind. The wanderer's bones cried out for rest, even if only for a moment, but the warmth of the golden sun above calmed his soul, and the lapping tide began to erode his will. His tired eyes could barely stay open, but in his vision he was still clear enough to see the horrible truth. The bone-white sand was made from the remains of those who had rested here and fallen into a coma of blissful indolence. His resolve hardened and the knight strode on towards the shimmering palace in the distance. 
It was there beneath the elegant spires that the wanderer came before almighty Slanesh. Statuesque and divinely glamorous, the deity visited in the form of a young man, possessed of androgynous beauty, clean-limbed and fresh with vigor of youth. The knight unsheathed his rune-edged sword and made to strike him down, but to his fore he found out that he could not, for the god prince was disarming in an innocence and utterly beguiling in his manner. Even the purest flame can be extinguished by the tide. In that single moment of doubt, the wanderer was lost. He knelt, bowing his head at last, and a single touch of the king's glowing specter on his shoulder sealed his fate for all of eternity. And that brings us to the end of this video. What did you guys think? Now, I didn't want to go too in-depth because I could literally make a video for each one of these domains of chaos. Uh, I did want to go a little bit in depth into the last one of Slanesh because this raises the question, who is the Silver Knight that made his way all the way to Slanesh's castle and actually saw Slanesh face to face? Um, in my opinion, I think it's Drago. I, uh, I don't know. I really like Drago. I think he can overcome anything and everything, but at the end of the day, he is still a mere mortal. Now, I really don't want it to be him, but all in all, I think it is Drago. What do you guys think? And uh, let me know in the comments down below. Now, if you guys do want me to go more in depth with this uh, realm of chaos and whatnot, uh, let me know. And uh, if, if I don't do it, Gershwan will get on it ASAP. Thanks again, guys, for all the support. And as always, I am the Sound Alchemist, part of One Mind Syndicate, and I am signing out. Oh, <laughs>